Good evening. Tonight we have a special appeal on the tragic case that's caused so many headlines today, the murder in her farmhouse of Janet Brown. And can you help identify this woman, a victim of a crime in Humberside last month? 2,105 viewers saw something they recognised last month. 250 of them rang about a series of sex attacks in Leeds. As a result of two of those calls, combined with police inquiries, a man was arrested last weekend and has been charged with rape. Eleven names were suggested for the murderer of Claire Hood. Claire, you may recall, bunked off from school and was attacked in woods near to her home in St Melons in Cardiff. The police have just started large-scale genetic fingerprinting. Hiya. Hiya. Uh, Tell Lambert, please. Come on, I'm going to be late. 1,400 callers rang on the uh, attack on Margaret Wilson, the farmer's wife, murdered by an apparent madman on a country lane in North Humberside. Her murder was witnessed by two tractor drivers. Hey, hell now, you've seen that bloke over there? Looks like you're running after Mrs Wilson. Bloody hell, he's jumped her. One seemingly exciting lead turned out to be mistaken. A detective still need to link a white Montego estate car with this face. But there's still a lot of evidence to work through. The armed robbery in Sheffield provoked on, 100 on. calls, 28 of them the police say useful. Some suspects are being checked against forensic clues. So. Well, our first appeal for your help tonight concerns the murder of Julie Finlay in Liverpool. Although eight months have passed now since she was killed, detectives believe there are still people who may have important information on the case. In fact, it wasn't until three months after Julie's death that the most important witness in the case so far came forward. And that's when our film begins in Liverpool, where Julie lived. What time are you going to Mum and Dad's on Sunday? Probably about one. Do you want to lift? Yeah, that'd be great. You could pick us up around quarter two. Just hang on a minute. I want to go and get a paper. Murder. Do you remember I told you about that girl who ran in front of my car outside the hospital? I was badly shaken because I nearly knocked her down. Yeah, so? Well, that's it. That's the girl. Maybe you should ring in and tell somebody about it. Come on. Incident room, Farmworth Street. Can I help you? Yes. So you recognise her from the poster, do you? And when exactly did this happen? Definitely that Friday, was it? Right, yeah. Can you remember anything else about her at all? Yeah. Julie Finley was 23. She'd lived all her life in Liverpool, growing up in a close family of five children. Julie's my second oldest child. As a child, she was very lovable, very kind, soft hearted. Julie started changing when she was about 19. My first notice when her personality. Starts changing. I got told that Julie was on drugs, which shocked me, really shocked me. I was very upset and very disappointed in Julie. Besides, you know, Julie was more sensible than that. Safe to touch drugs. Although Julie's addiction to heroin had dramatically changed her life, she'd remained close to her family. Oh, yeah, finally bringing this stuff back. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't remember. We're not found them anymore. Is my mum in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mum, it's our Julie! Hello, Hello Michelle. Michelle. How are you doing, love? I'm all right, I'm a bit tired. A bit run down, you know. Mm. How are you? Yeah, same as usual. Nothing new. You've just missed your dad. He's gone out for the afternoon. I'll see him when he gets back in. Yeah. Can I have a bath? Do yeah, go up. There's still some hot water left. Feeling better? Mm hmm. You taking care of yourself? Mm, trying to. Mum, can I borrow three pounds? Sure. Pass me by. I'll give it back when I get my chair. Don't, don't worry about it. There you go. That's nice. Start. Shall I come round Sunday lunch? Yeah, that'd be nice. Listen, I've got to get off, alright, but I'll see you on Sunday. Yeah. 
Look after yourself. Okay. Julie and her boyfriend had recently moved into a friend's flat near Faulkner Square. So how was your mum's then? Fine. She wants me to go around for Sunday lunch. Oh, you gonna go? Yeah, probably. You going out soon then? Yeah, I better get going, really. What time do you think you'll be back? Oh, a couple of hours. All right, see you later then. See ya. The neighbourhood is a well-known red light area, and Julie mixed frequently with the local prostitutes. That night, a prostitute who knew Julie saw her in Grove Street. Julie mentioned she was expecting to meet someone at 11. It was shortly after 11, and not far from here, that the witness who saw the poster was driving home along Pembroke Place. Julie seemed to be running towards someone across the road. This man would have been one of the last people to see Julie alive. The next day, 15 miles outside Liverpool. Yeah, Liverpool Century Road Club were having a 10 mile time trial race on the Rainford Bypass. Oh, Kevin, I'm on there. Not too bad. 120? Yeah. I'd gone along to collect my number and my start time. Um, after I collected that, I wanted to answer the call of nature before I set off. So I uh, headed to some bushes uh, by a field at the side of the layby. Mike, here, quick! I think I found a dead body in it. We better have a look. Julie had been strangled. And, you know, it's just odd. This mother says that there was not, no card, nothing from it. I just went to her grave. The flowers I got from Mother's Day, I put them on Julie's. You know, because I miss her so much and I loved her. Well, Mr Yule, you have one witness who saw something which could be very important. It was on the night Julie died and at the lay-by where her body was found at around the time she was died. She died as well. That's correct, yes. At about 12.45am on the morning that Julie's body was to be found uh, later, a white transit van with a D, E or F registration was seen in the lay-by, which is near the Weechief public house on the Rainford Bypass. Um, there could be one of three reasons this vehicle was there. Either it was used and the girl was killed in the back of it. Secondly, her body could have been transported to the scene in that vehicle. Or thirdly, it may be that it's quite an innocent reason it's there, namely a courting couple who have been reticent to come forward because perhaps they were embarrassed. If that latter is the case, please, discretion will be the watchword with me. If they come forward, let's just eliminate this. It's most important that we find this family. Right, so please do call if that was you. The last definite sighting of Julie herself is still back in Liverpool in Pembroke Place near her flat. Yes, that's right. As you've seen from the film, that uh, a man was seen to be uh, approached by Julie who was obviously anxious to speak to him. He may well be her drug dealer. Uh, the man's description, about 28 years, 5 foot 10 to 6 foot, stocky build, dark, tidy hair and dressed in dark clothing. Now... I'm not interested in the drugs aspect, I'm interested in finding the killer. And so I would ask anybody who can suggest who this man may be, uh, or who was in the area at the time, to come forward again in complete confidence. Right. Now some of Julie's clothes are still missing. That's absolutely right, and if I can show Where clothes they... that we've purchased. These are a white blouse and brown buttons at the top and black jeans. They're in good condition. They were found by a young man the following day uh, on the wasteland at Low Hill. Um, the young man didn't read anything into this and left them, but he didn't contact the police for several days. And when we arrived, and happily, 
the clothes had disappeared. We do believe firmly that they were Julie's. We feel whoever's taken them has committed no crime, but found that they're in good condition, could utilise them. So I say to them, it's absolutely essential we find those clothes for forensic examination. They're in no trouble. Come forward, please let me have them. Absolutely vital. If you can help, please do call. Your information and your identity will be treated with great discretion. Detectives and BBC staff are here answering calls in the studio, 0500 600 600. Or you can ring Mr Yule's colleagues at the incident room in Liverpool on 0151 777 3600. That's 0151 for Liverpool, 777 3600. Now the murder of a woman found in Humberside, not far from the case we showed last month, the attack on Mrs Margaret Wilson. Now, contrary to some reports, police think that the two incidents are unrelated. A week ago, a body was discovered on a grass verge in Middleton on the Wolds. It's just north of Beverley. The victim had been beaten about the head and she'd been dead for at most two days. Now, tonight, there's been a possible identification of the victim, but police can't be certain. So, do you know who she was? She was white, between 45 and 55, 5 foot 9 and a half. She weighed 8 stone. She was in good physical condition, possibly a member of a gym or a health club, and she had a suntan. Her hair was short and grey, with red and blonde highlights. She wore pearl stud earrings. She had a small scar on her stomach. Her teeth had undergone expensive cosmetic treatment, including five gold crowns and a number of porcelain caps. She was wearing a tartan, double-breasted jacket from Hamels, a light green jumper with a collar, chest size 42, and a green skirt with a matching wide green belt. And in her jacket was this shopping list, written presumably by her in ink. Terps, drawing pad, swimming hat, stapler and staples, two canvases, pliers. Well, either she was an artist or was she buying for a friend? If you recognise her, please call 0500 600 600 or try the incident room on 01 482 597 880. That's 01 482, the code for Hull, 597 880. Well, now to Photocall, which had a strong response last month. The woman bottom right, what is in connection there with a series of deceptions, has been arrested. In all the other cases, viewers' calls have led to new leads. But now here are Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames with this month's appeals. Scott Anderson may have information about a fatal stabbing that took place in the early hours of Sunday the 26th of March in Frankley, West Midlands. 28-year-old Mark Garrett tried to intervene in a dispute between two men in the Arden shopping centre and was stabbed in the stomach. He died two days later. Scott Anderson is 21, 5 foot 10, slim, with black hair and a Midlands accent. He has connections throughout the West Midlands as well as Scotland and London. If you know where he is now, please call. Colleagues would like to talk to this man in connection with a series of deceptions on London tourists. On January the 13th, a man befriended a Japanese woman near Buckingham Palace and persuaded her to lend him money. The personal details he gave her were false. Over the next few months, a number of similar incidents occurred in the vicinity of the British Museum, National Gallery and Tate Gallery. Do you recognise the man? He sometimes calls himself Richard or Michael Stevenson. Please call us if you can help. Between the 25th of February and the 15th of March, this man held up three building societies in South East England armed with a kitchen knife. Here he is on the 15th of March at the Alliance and Leicester in Chatham, Kent. He threatened staff before making off with a substantial amount of money. Two weeks earlier, the same man robbed the Leeds Permanent in Portsmouth. This time he was disguised with sunglasses and a hat. Take another look at him. He's between 40 and 50, over six foot and of stocky build. He has short greying hair and a protruding chin. If you know who or where he is, please call. This is Mohammed Akmal Malik, and West Yorkshire Police would like to speak to him in connection with a series of deceptions. Since 1989, a number of women in the Yorkshire area have lost a substantial amount of money. In March of this year, one victim was left homeless when her property was repossessed. Take another look at Mr Malik. He's described as Asian, six foot two and of average build. Colleagues believe he may now be married and living under an assumed name in Edinburgh or Birmingham. If you know where he is, call us tonight. Finally, can you identify the robber who went into this building society in Wood Green, North London, last November? After parking his bicycle, he ran inside, forcing a customer backwards. He then pulled out a large knife and demanded money. But he was foiled. Fortunately, the customer came to no harm. The robber was in his early 20s, about 5 foot 8 and slim. 
He had an Irish accent and rode away on an orange-coloured bicycle. Call us if you recognise him, or you can help with any of our other photo call cases. And the number to ring if you do recognise any of those faces, or if you can help with any of tonight's cases, 0500 600 600. 0500 600 600. And now to Holloway, North London, on a Friday morning four months ago. OK, John, I'll tell you, your man is ready now. I noticed a parcel force van going around and around a few times. The guy in the passenger seat was acting very, very peculiar. You know, it's like he didn't want to be seen. As I was waiting for my friend to pay for his breakfast, um, I was outside and I noticed this same red van came around again. I feel these guys are having us on, isn't it? These have been around four times already. A bit fun, isn't it? I noticed the guys inside didn't really look like postmen because they were acting very peculiar. Go back to the van and get it. He's tall, 5'10", clean shaven, very dark hair, curly, with a short tash. I thought to myself straight away, I've got a gun in my stomach, I'm just do what he says, and just carry on with it. Again. This is a disused warehouse at the back of Ashburton Grove. John and I was both all right. And I think eventually we had about three weeks off till we went back to work again. The same crew, three months later. I think it's the batteries. I'll fix them up later when we do the drop of curries. Coming in as well. I looked at him and I just just felt like killing him because like, I knew he was like the same same person as for the first time. The only difference was he didn't have a tash this time. Okay, everything sweet. The second man was stocky and he was fat, aged late thirties, early forties, short brown hair, clean shaven. 
For several minutes, people walked past while the hijackers tried to restart the van. They'd had to overcome a security device. Did you see the vehicle or anything suspicious? This time, they went to a disused warehouse on Western Road, Wood Green. Get the engine started, quick. They must have got the keys in the back. Come on, what are you doing? I really start! Oh, no! Don't help! Oh, Shut up and let me think, will you? Open the door and no one gets hurt. We've had a look round, there's no way out. And um, I've turned around and said to John, look, they've got the ignition keys. The, the only thing to do is let them back in. So, um, took a gamble. Yes, Miller, this is a gang who doesn't know when to stop. There's been a total of five, at least, of these crimes you can now link together. Yes, that's correct. Um, the offences have all been committed by men carrying firearms which may have been loaded. We consider there a danger to the public. And it's obviously been terrifying for the men involved, and we've rather sanitised what, what happened there. Tell us about the, the people. We've got quite a good picture of at least one of them. Yes, that's right. One of the robbers um, has featured... Uh, um, very much up front on all occasions. He's uh, uh, described as about 45 years old with uh, brown curly hair, sometimes with a moustache, and in most cases he wears tinted glasses when committing offences. You can see him there without the moustache. There's a, a very different looking picture of him, but you're sure it's the same person. This is an electronic picture, an e-fit. E uh, that's definitely the same man. The second robber we saw in the film holding the, the uh, radio to his face, yes. There's a third one you've got quite a good picture of as well there. Yes, he featured in one of the other incidents. Um, and we, we think that uh, he's probably just another member of the gang. Do you know anything more about him? He's in his 50s, this chap. Yes, he's older than the other two. He's described uh, as smaller, 5 foot 6, 5 foot 7, stocky build with uh, suntan, patchy suntan on his face and freckles. OK, there's a substantial reward on this and incidentally, this was left behind at uh, a more recent and uh, aborted raid that took place, would you believe, the day that uh, our film crews were filming this reconstruction. It's uh, got blue paint on it. Yes, someone's obviously hand-painted this with uh, navy blue paint. We'd uh, like to discover who did that and also uh, where it's been. OK, so if you know anything about this blue bike padlock, let us know. Here's our number, 0500 600 600. Or you can try the Flying Squad incident room in London on 0171. 230-2061. That's the Flying Squad on 0171-230-2061. Well, now the case that has made tragic headlines today, the murder of Janet Brown. She lived in Radnage, Buckinghamshire, and detectives know that three days ago, at around 8.30 on Monday evening, she made a phone call to a friend. After that, only whoever killed her knows what happened. At 8 o'clock next morning, a builder heard the burglar alarm ringing and his son went to investigate. Detectives now believe from the initial forensic examination that Janet's house had been searched, so robbery could well have been the motive. Mrs Brown was first accosted in her bedroom where she pressed the panic alarm before being taken downstairs. These are the handcuffs that her assailant left behind, but these are only important if you can link them together with some of the other clues. A grey-brown car, similar to a Ford Escort, was seen in a lay-by about 150 yards from Janet Brown's house in Spriggs Holly Lane. Now, this was on Friday, three days before the murder, at 7.30 in the evening. And it seemed that the occupant was trying to conceal his face. Two local people saw the same car on different occasions in the Radnage area. One neighbour saw it twice on the same day. 
First of all, she saw two men in it, one black, one white. And then later on, she saw one white and three black men in the car, driving slowly and then accelerating as if they were looking for something. It's crucial this car is eliminated quickly. If not, its occupants must become prime suspects. If they're innocent, then please do call us straight away to clear this sighting from the inquiry. Now, that was last Friday. On Monday evening, a small car was seen parked in the same lay-by in Spriggs Holly Lane, 150 yards from Janet's house. It might have been a Metro, a Fiesta, possibly the grey-brown Ford Escort. Again, please call us if you can eliminate this car from the investigation. Detectives have been searching for a motorcyclist seen in Radnitch Village, but this now seems to have been traced and excluded from inquiries. So to sum up, do you know somebody who was out late on Monday night in the Radnitch area? Somebody who had, had access to a small car, who might have owned those handcuffs, and who very probably came home with unexplained blood on himself or his clothes. Please don't hesitate to call. Innocent people can be quickly eliminated. 0500 600 600 is the number. 0500 600 600. The response to our incident desk appeals last month was exceptional in the worst sense, in that four out of five of the inquiries were taken no further at all. The case involving deceptions and stolen checks in Bedfordshire, though, received well over 200 calls and we're told an arrest on that one is quite likely in the near future. We're hoping for other better results this month. Here again are Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames. First, please think back two months to Monday the 6th of February at about 10.30 in the evening. On that night, this man assaulted a woman in the London area, the latest of six such attacks. No! No! What are you doing? What's going on? Nothing. I, I think there's something going on up there, though. Hey. Can you update me about this assault? The victim's a little bit shaken, sir, but luckily a local resident chased him off. We're still down at the scene with the socos, but everything I've heard so far points to our man, and I think this is another one in the series. I think you're right, sir. Tonight's attack was here in Albury Mews. Just remind me where the other ones were. All the others were in the Finsbury Park area and started in January 1993. Since then, he appears to have moved on to the West End. The last attack that we knew of was also in Albury Mews last year when he attacked that girl. Yes, sir. On that occasion, she was picked up on Oxford Street on Wednesday the 12th of October. I'd been to a concert in North London and the concert ended pretty late. Um, but I decided to take the tube and get off at Oxford Circus because I knew I could catch night buses there. Do you go to South Kensington? Uh, no, not this one, dear. You need to catch a bus just down the road there. OK, thanks. i would only been in London for, like, I think, three four weeks and to me it seemed like a pretty safe place. Excuse me, have you got a time on you? No, sorry, I don't have a watch on me. Right. Can you tell me where I can catch a bus to South Kensington? South Kensington? Yeah, actually, there's a stop just up the road. It's not far away. Look, I'm going that way myself. I'll show you if you like. Oh, okay, thanks. Great. He just seemed like such a nice, average type person that there could be nothing else that he wanted. He just wanted to be, like, friendly. And then it just all turned. It was so convincing that she was totally taken in by him. They walked for about ten minutes, and that's when he tricked her into the muse, and that's where he raped her. And she was the one who was able to do this artist's impression? Yes, he's early 20s, about five foot eight, not very tall. Slim build, with fair, straight hair. And tonight's victim gave the same description? Yes, Governor. Right. We must circulate this to every police station in London. Our main priority is to trace any other women who may have come in contact with him or even been taken in by him. The more we get to know about this man, the quicker we are to find him. So the police have no reported sightings of this man between early 1993 in Finsbury Park and October last year in Oxford Street. 
Do you recognize him? Have you been approached by him? He's early to mid-twenties, about five foot eight, slim build, with fair, straight hair. And he sometimes calls himself Paul. Please, if you can help in any way, call the incident room on 0171 275 3145. That's 0171 275 3145. On Tuesday the 7th of February in Clapham, South London, a 56-year-old man was murdered in a terrible and unprovoked attack. The victim, Frank Dempsey, was making a telephone call in Clapham Park Road at about 7.30pm. He was with his woman friend. Frank had suffered for some time from pleurisy, and as he left the phone box, he coughed to clear his throat. A man who was walking past accused Frank of spitting, and without waiting for a response, stabbed him in the chest. This is what the offender looked like. He's in his 20s, between 5 foot 7 and 6 foot. Slim to medium build, possibly with a thin moustache. He was wearing a baseball hat, dark trousers and a baggy jacket with distinctive stripes on the sleeves. Two witnesses were known to have been in the area at the time. Now it's vital that they come forward. The first was seen leaving the William Bonney estate at the time of the attack and he was white with shoulder length hair and wearing a long coat. It's possible that the attacker then ran down Holwood Place, past our second witness, who was black, in his 20s, wearing a dark bomber jacket with writing on the back. Although Frank Dempsey received emergency treatment almost immediately, he died in hospital three days later. Remember, it was just after 7.30pm on Tuesday the 7th of February. If you know this man, or can help in any way, please call the investigating officers on 0171 230-5818. That's 0171-230-5818. Finally, a sex attack on a 30-year-old woman which took place over a year ago. The victim was so traumatised by the ordeal that she has only recently been able to help police compile this ethic of her attacker. It took place on Friday the 18th of March 1994 when she visited her son at Grimsby District Hospital in Humberside. At around 10.15pm, she went to the ladies' toilets near the main entrance, where she was confronted by a man. He subjected her to a violent assault. Take another look at him. He's described as 20 to 30 years old, 5 foot 8 inches tall, with dark brown hair. He had blue dots tattooed on the knuckles of each hand, and he wore these distinctive earrings. If you know who he is, please don't hesitate to call our colleagues in Grimsby on 01472 254380. That's 01472, the code for Grimsby, 254380. And the number here in the studio, if you can help, is 0500 600 600. That's free call 0500 600 600. Our last appeal tonight is a robbery at the home of a retired couple in Hull. They've lived in the same house for nearly 40 years. Their three children all grew up there. Nine weeks ago, they were robbed. Everything they had of any value was stolen, together with their peace of mind. The way the robbery was carried out has made sure of that. Our reconstruction starts in the small hours of Wednesday, February the 8th, the day before the robbery took place. Two men hanging around the top of the drive. One appeared to be looking at the house. He was around 28 years of age, heavily tattooed, with dark hair and a moustache. The second man, he was about six foot tall and about 30 years of age, dark complexion and had short cropped hair. I remember at the time thinking it was odd that they were there at that time of night. BBC News at nine o'clock on Wednesday the 8th of February. Dublin called on Britain last night. To I spent its quite a lot of time here inevitably on my own while my husband had to go away on business. And I've always felt confident and quite secure. It's never been a problem. It's now sometime after 10.30 that same morning.
Oh, hello. While I'm in the area, do you need any trees cutting or anything like that? Uh, well, no, we're all right, thanks. Um, we have somebody that comes regularly. You sure? Yeah, thanks all the same. OK. I'd never seen this person before. He was a complete stranger. As far as we know, this man didn't call at any other houses in the neighbourhood. The next day, Thursday the 9th of February, Joan and Raymond had various appointments. There will be problems. It's so very new. It's the newest thing. Raymond went to a meeting at Hull University where he serves on the council. It's now just after seven in the evening. Raymond and Joan were expecting a visit from their son and his family the following day. So stupid. John's coming with a kid tomorrow and I've not fixed this yet. You'd better hurry up, wouldn't you? Have you got a bad heart? No. I really was very frightened indeed. It all happened so quickly. And there am I, knocked down on the floor, uh, all this noise going on, and wondering what they're going to do before they go. There's three bedrooms up here, all right? Have a good look round, and I want you to go down into the study, all right? Keep your head down. <laughs> Raymond. He's OK. The man who spent most of the time with me had a Hull accent. The man who was restraining me was very definitely Hull. The ringleader definitely had a Lancashire twang. Right. Where's the safe? There's a camera. The bloody alarm's not turned off. I thought a camera is a sensor. It's part of the... We're taking you through to the hall. They were obviously prepared to be violent. There was no point in not telling them anything they wanted to know. Keep your hands still. She's got a bloody panic alarm. She's pressing something. No, I'm not. I'm not. Stick her in the chair. There. I can hear an alarm. Even the routine off-the-hook warning signal panicked them. If it's an alarm, we'll shoot your wife. It's not our alarm. We're going in a while. You're not to move. Have they gone? Yes, I think so. This has had a bigger effect than we like to admit. Uh, the house that we lived in for 37 years is not the same. We are very nervous about actually walking outside the house at the dark. And I sleep badly now, which I never used to do. I feel it was a very traumatic experience. It's spoiled house for us. It's no longer the home that we made and lived in. And it's put years on us. Well, Duncan Gray, and as I said earlier, it's the loss of peace of mind which is most devastating. Yeah, I think the usual type of burglary is traumatic enough, but on top of this, this couple had to endure the, uh, the violence when they were bundled down to the floor and bound, put into fear when they were threatened, 
and of course they had to suffer the humiliation of seeing the property taken out uh, in the prisons. I know you feel it's urgent to find these men. How, how are we going to find them? What are they like? The descriptions are vague. Obviously, they're all uh, masked and, and gloved. I think that perhaps what's more important in this case are, are their accents. Uh, two have been described as having Hull accents, one which was broader than the other. And the third one had as what's described as a Lancashire accent. And I'm, I'm hopeful that that combination will help us trace them. That Thursday evening, shortly before the robbery, some local people recognised saw some strangers in the area. Could they be the mm. same men? That's a possibility. We'd like to trace them to, to eliminate them. The two men were seen just over an hour before the robbery, quite near the house, and they were in a Fiat Panda, a dark-coloured Fiat Panda car. The driver, the description of him is vague. He's sort of got short, fair hair and he's clean-shaven. The passenger is, is much more distinctive. He was a very large man. He'd got short, cropped hair or even a shaven head. And it's been said that it could resemble the actor Brian Glover. Right, we certainly need to find them if only to eliminate them. Everything do. they had, this couple, valuable and not so valuable, was stolen. There's a lot of property being taken, including silverware and jewellery, but obviously the paintings are, are the more identifiable. What's probably the uh, better known ones are, in fact, two Lowry's. Now, all the paintings have been circulated amongst the trade, uh, but the, there's too many paintings early to show at this time. And obviously I would ask the viewers if they recognise any of the paintings they see on this programme to contact us. Or if they've got any information or any doubts about any other paintings, then please contact us. Great. So if you do recognise any of those paintings, if you can offer any kind of lead towards those men, you can ring us now. There is, I must say, a particularly substantial reward. 0500 600 600 is the number here, or you can ring Mr Durham's headquarters direct on 01482 856 556. That's 01482 for Hull, 856 556. I'm still trying to catch up on the calls as they, as they come. An enormous response on photo call. We've now had at least 10. I think it's now up to 12 or 13 callers giving the same name on one of the people there. I won't tell you which case it is for obvious reasons. Detectives will be going out to that right now. On the Julie Finlay murder, an enormous number of calls, some giving uh, names of friends of hers and others which are being followed up at the moment. Far more to tell you but we'll have more news later on, so... Absolutely, more news in just under an hour's time, in fact. We're back with the Crime Watch update at 5 past 11. But, of course, we'll be taking calls here continuously until midnight. So don't give up if you haven't managed to get through yet. If you can help at all, we do need to hear from you. If you won't be waiting up for the update, we'll see you after Easter on the 18th of next month. Have a good Easter, a good uh, Pasaki, a good Passover, a good holiday if you've got one. Above all, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night. seem to have had quite a high volume of calls since we've been away, so much in fact that it's quite hard to sort out which are the new leads. But I can say that one of our cases certainly does seem to be on the way to being solved. More on that in a minute. Lightning, they say, it doesn't strike twice. It did for the crew of a Security Express van. They were held up in North London last December and then again last month by the same gang. Dennis Miller, uh, quite a good response on this, quite a lot of calls, 70 I think so far, but the best ones from colleagues of yours, fellow police officers. Yes, we've had two calls um, come in, one from an ex-detective superintendent who served on the flying squad. Um, he was able to give us a name which we're considering and we'll be looking into in the uh, future. Again, uh, another police officer rang with information about a search that he did. Um, guns and uh, post office uniforms were found at that address and that's another one that we'll be considering. The description fits the suspect. We had some quite good descriptions. A man with a moustache and uh, we were able to show him without the moustache. Other pictures that, uh, that followed as well. What have non-police officers been able to contribute to this? Well, we've had a, a considerable amount of um, names put up for the suspects. Uh, a very good response all round, really. A lot of work for you. Uh, do any of those names ring bells? Not at the moment. There's a lot of research to be done, I think. Good. All right. Thanks very much, Sue. 
Well, next, the murder of Julie Finlay in Liverpool. The last known witness to have seen Julie alive was driving along Pembroke Place in Liverpool just after 11 o'clock on the night of Friday, August the 5th. Well, Julie seemed to be running towards a man waiting on the other side of the road. And, uh, Mr Yule, Julie's murder was eight months ago, but you really were hoping that somebody would shed some new light on what happened to her. What response have you had? Yes, I've had quite an encouraging response, yeah. though, with regard to the various appeals are made. With regard to the man that was seen in Pembroke Place, I've had a number of calls. I wish to stress that if this man was not the killer, he certainly was one of the last to see her alive and in his own interest should come forward. Uh, I have had a suggestion that a drug dealer who uses the nickname of Nelly, whose identity I am anxious to, to uh, uh, come up with, um, has previously come into the inquiries. So I'm most anxious to find out who Nelly is. Um, the van, uh, the occupants have still not come forward from the lay-by. And again, if they are innocent, please come forward. Let's eliminate them. Oh, in all cases, you're going to be absolutely discreet about the people who come forward. Oh, absolutely. That, that, that must be the thing, that we understand that, and otherwise we'll get no help in this. Right. Remember, the night was Friday, August the 5th, so please do ring if you can help. We've had more than 20 callers on the unidentified body that was found in Humberside about uh, a week ago. As I said earlier, a tentative identification has been made, and some of our calls tonight have lent substance to that, but we're not going to confirm reports on that until the body has been formally identified, uh, not least by members of the family. Let's see, though, how we've been getting on with Photocorn. Actually, Jackie, you've got rather a lot to tell us. Still coming in as well, Nick. Uh, the first chap we wanted to speak to, Scott Anderson, in connection with that fatal stabbing in West Midlands. About a dozen calls, but a couple of callers have suggested he's now using the same new name. Um, so that looks, does look very promising. Uh, the second case, we were looking for a man who's been deceiving tourists in central London. And allowed himself to be photographed by one of them. Yes, that was good of him. Um, about 20 calls, and two of which, again, have given the same name and de background details. So those two co calls could be the right ones. The best response, by a long short, was the man who took a knife and tried to rob a building society in Kent. Yeah, absolutely tremendous. We've been inundated here. And over 30 of those calls have suggested the same name. So we are quite confident we think we know who he is. But if you know where he is, you could really help us so please call if you know. What about Ahmad Malik? Uh, again, enormous response. Over 35 calls just here. Um, numerous in the incident room and a number again have given um, the same details of where he may be and this sort of thing. We've also had a half a dozen callers who think they may have been deceived in a similar way. So that again could help the officers enormously. Good. Jackie, I've just seen some more coming in there. Thanks very much indeed. Sue. Well, next, the robbery at the home of a retired couple in Hull. In the small hours of the day before the robbery, a witness saw two men watching the house. And then at around 7.30 the following evening, which was Thursday the 9th of February, the couple were attacked. She's got a bloody panic alarm. She's pressing something. No, I'm not. I'm not. Well, everything they had of value was stolen. And, uh, in fact, it's only just been over half an hour since uh, we made that appeal. How are you doing on calls? That's right. We've had an excellent response so far. We got over 70 calls within the first 20 minutes, and the total's now near 100. Right. What's the best information, as far as you can see? We've had suggestions as to the uh, identity of the woodcutter. We've also had suggestions to the identity of the men in the Fiat, but obviously we'd welcome more. Uh, we've still got to, to eliminate right. those people. That Fiat Panda, of course, is really important to find it out. It is. It certainly is. There yeah. are so many sightings of men on different in di occasions that you need to sort out whether they're the same men and certainly eliminate them from your inquiries. We certainly need to welcome, we would welcome more calls on both those and also the men in the drive, not forgetting them. Right. We're still uh, open to take calls on the men in the drive. Yep. We haven't had as many on those as the other two. Again, they may or may not be the same men. You need to find out. Exactly. What about the paintings? One or two suggestions as to where some of the paintings may be. But once again, that's... Uh, Open plenty of painters. I haven't seen them all. If anyone's got any doubts about any paintings that have been offered or any paintings that uh, they've seen, please call. We'll eliminate them. We've got all the details and we can uh, help on that. And that might be anywhere in the country, of course. That could be anywhere at all. Yes. Duncan, thanks very much. Keep taking the calls. Thank you. Big numbers of calls on incident desk. Uh, what sort of quality is it, David? Very good. In the first case on that London rapes court, we've had 35 calls, a lot of them suggesting names, Nick, uh, and other leads that we're, we're following up. 
what we're looking for is this guy who calls himself Paul, and if you've been approached by him, please do call us, regardless of the circumstances. There are not suspicions. Interested in, in minor offences or other things, this man's attacked six women and raped them, and we must find I him. I think there are suspicions after calls tonight that he's, he's probably attacked more women than the, the six we already knew about. That's possible. Frank Dempsey, the murder of Frank Dempsey. Yes, we've had one interesting name there, not so many calls, but what we're really keen on is the response we've had from the Humberside sexual attack. We've had 18 calls suggesting names. That was uh, the rape in the Grimsby Hospital. That's right. And we've had calls about those dots that the man had on his knuckles, but what we're really interested in is, as well, these earrings that he was wearing that are fairly distinctive. It's a couple of hooped rings with a cross on one of them. If you know who or where he is, please do still call us. It's urgent we find him too. David, thank you. Sue? Well, as far as I can see, there haven't been many calls yet on the murder of Janet Brown in Radnage in Buckinghamshire. We're still hoping for a lead on the small grey or brown car which was seen near Mrs Brown's house last Friday evening, or on the car which was seen in the same place on Monday, the night she died. Once again, it was a small car, possibly the same one. There were four men, three black and one white, seen in it on the last occasion. All the cases we've asked for your help on tonight are serious crimes. So if you do know something and you haven't got round to picking up the phone yet, please do call. Our lines are open now for another half an hour or so till midnight and uh, the individual incident room numbers will be on the screen in a moment. I should give you nearly 45 minutes. And of course, there'll be more to tell you by next month. We're back on Thursday, May the 18th. Meanwhile, have a happy and peaceful Easter break and uh, if you're off to bed soon, sleep well. Good night. Good night.